Okay. Uh, so welcome to our December webinar. Uh, as you can see, our topic for, for this evening will be avoiding emotions and skin picking. Uh, before I get started, uh, there's a poll that's active for uh, our January topic. If there's a topic that I don't put in the in the polls every month and that you would really like to see, put it in the Q&A. Just type something like topic proposal and then just put it there and I will put it on the list so that everyone else can vote on the topic next month. Now, I like the idea of allowing you to choose topics. So anything that will that will get new ideas in, I'm all for it. So yeah, uh, when we finish the main part of the webinar, before we go to the q and I will close the poll and then we will see what will be the topic for next month because I know that not everyone waits until our you know, hour and something long q and A's end. So I want to let everyone know what the topic will be. So let's get started and with our topic tonight. So these are some of the things that we will be talking about. So first, we'll talk a little bit about what experiential avoidance is and uh, why is it that we tend to avoid our emotions. Uh, I will also be talking about um, what's the benefit of avoiding emotions. Because obviously, since we employ these behaviors all the time, there is something about them that works. So we will be talking about this a little bit as well. But then we will talk about implicit assumptions about emotions, because one of the reasons we avoid something and not avoid some other things is because of the way that we see these things about what we anticipate might happen or uh, what effects something might have on us or people around us. So these implicit assumptions about emotions um, are really why we avoid them. And also they tell us a little bit about the way in which we avoid them. So naturally, if we want to stop avoiding something, we have to examine why is it that we're doing it in the first place. Uh, take this section as, as an invitation for you to think about how this concerns you specifically, because I don't think there's a general generic answer that can be given. I will show you through various examples rather than to offer you a comprehensive theory. Uh, we'll talk about consequences of avoidance, and then we'll talk about acceptance as the polar opposite of avoidance and why acceptance is important. And then I will give you some pointers, although very general and kind of brush strokes uh, about how to change the way you relate to your feelings so that you change some of the avoidance. Uh, this is a very big topic. This is why I said I will paint the picture in kind of broad brush strokes. And then if one of the topics that I put here in the poll that are related to this sort of wins, then next month we can continue the, the discussion in more details. And then in the end, as always, uh, there's the Q&A section where you can ask about anything. And you can ask even while I'm, while I'm giving you the webinar and then I will respond to hopefully all of the questions. Um, so let's get started by defining terms. So when we talk about experiential avoidance, what is it that we're talking about? Uh, this is a definition by Hayes who is, um, who's the father of acceptance and commitment therapy. So an experiential avoidance is really the central concept of acceptance and commitment therapy. So this is his definition. Uh, the experiential avoidance is the phenomenon that occurs when a person is unwilling to remain in contact with particular private experiences. So we're talking about body sensations, emotions, thoughts, memories, or certain behavioral predispositions like patterns of, of behavior that we have and may employ in certain situations. And so not only that, but we also take steps to alter the form or frequency of these events and the contexts that occasion them. This is a bit of a mouthful of a definition. So I'm just going to go ahead and reduce it all to two terms. One, unwilling or rather lack of willingness to remain in contact with our experiences and then altering them either by altering frequency or altering form. These are the most important things to take away from this. Uh, unwillingness itself is not very helpful. It's, I think, much, much more helpful to consider what is it that we're willing to do if we're not willing to remain in contact with our experiences. So you're willing to avoid them. You're willing to kind of sidestep them, to overrun them, to convert them into something else. That way, I think it, it makes it much more accessible as a concept. 
So it's your willingness to alter your current experiences. I hope that definition makes sense to you. Uh, so it's, it's, let me just repeat one more time. So willingness to alter our current experience in order to avoid certain implications that it may have or that we feel it may have. So as you can see, it's, it's a very broad definition and it can encompass a lot of things. We're going to talk about connections of emotional avoidance and skin picking, but the same mechanism is behind many other behaviors, some of which, or many of which we wouldn't really consider you know, a problem. For example, procrastination is also an obvious form of avoidance. Um, watching Netflix is very often a form of avoidance. Uh, so those would be some examples. I will give you a lot more examples on the way. Just kind of point out that if you're avoiding, if, if skin picking is one of the ways in which you avoid emotions, it's most likely not the only way. So it's pretty important to, so that you can understand a broader picture of why is it that you do it. It's really important to consider other avoidant behaviors as well. Hopefully what all the things that can be emotional, uh, that can be avoidant, will become clearer as, as we talk about it a little more. So before we go into examples of avoidance, let's see why is it that we choose to avoid something to begin with. It's like of all the things that you can do, why on earth would you avoid stuff? Um, the, the, I could give you more obvious answers, but I kind of like to go with whatever Kelly says, as, as you may know by now. And he has a, a part of his theory that deals with choices that we make is particularly fascinating to me. And I think that was the, when I read something called the choice corollary, which is one of the foundations of his theory, that's where I truly just fell in love with it. So Kelly says, like, says this, so a person chooses for himself or herself, that alternative, let's, let's ignore the dichotomized construct thing for now, through which he or she anticipates the greater possibility for extension and definition of his or her system. So this, this is again, another mouthful of a definition, but it's rather easy to simplify. Kelly says that we don't choose what's logical. We don't choose what's obvious. We choose what brings us more clarity. So not less, not necessarily less suffering, not necessarily more happiness, just more clarity. And this is why I really, really like this definition when I first heard it, it was like I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, um, because it, for me, at least, it explained a lot of the things that I would see working with people every day. People will choose things that would obviously be very difficult or harmful. Let's just look at skin picking, for example. Uh, how many times, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I know I shouldn't be doing it, yet I am doing it. And it doesn't really refer only to, to kind of mindless picking. It also refers to focus picking. It's like, there's a moment when it's, when it's a conscious choice, like I must do this now, I have to. It feels like there's no choice, but it's a conscious decision. And then it, it, when, I, when I read this definition for the first time, it really became clear to me that this is really spot on because it, it's not a logical choice. It's not the simplest choice, but it is a choice that gives a lot of clarity because it gives a certain degree of control. It gives you a set of tools that you can use to predict and act in the world. Uh, there's another phenomenon that I've noticed in therapy, of therapy of anything, not just skin picking, is that once people kind of start understanding what the problem is, and when they start reaching this threshold of making real change and kind of taking the first steps, they will experience an improvement. And then sometimes it will happen that they suddenly, suddenly just go into this, not, not one step back, but five steps back. And it used to puzzle me before Kelly. And then once I read this definition and a lot of text accompanying it, I actually realized that it, it, it makes a lot of logical sense from a constructivist perspective. Because when you start changing, changing is by definition doing something new, something you've never done before. So something that you don't have an elaborate predictive system for. You don't have ideas about how to anticipate things that have never happened to you before, things that you've never done before. So Choosing to step into change is really a choice between choosing something new, potentially better, but just potentially better because you don't know yet, but also something very confusing, something that 
that's so new that you don't have rules and regulations and no firm anticipations, or you can just fall back into your old patterns, which may be painful, which may be harmful, which may cause, I don't know, scars and, and a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. But this is something that you've known and something that you've been with for a very long time. And therefore, you have a great possibility to anticipate a wide variety of events. You may anticipate something horrible and something painful, but you have clarity. So when we choose avoidance, just to go back to the topic, otherwise I'll just digress endlessly. So when, when we choose avoidance over facing certain emotions, you're actually choosing what is clear to you. Like what from your personal experience gives you more possibility to act and, and do more things basically. It's like you open more possibilities for yourself rather than to face something that is potentially painful and even destructive, at least in the way that we anticipated. So choosing avoidance over emotions is choosing clarity over confusion, choosing order over chaos. I, for me, that's one way to frame the idea why is it that people would actually avoid their own emotions. So there's a little more on this. I'm not going to read the whole text because it's quite long. It's an article about this definition from the, um, from the Internet Encyclopedia of Personal Construct Theory. This is not the prettiest website, but it's, it's a nice introduction to Kelly's theory. So there are three points that I want to emphasize here. Uh, one is that when I talk about choosing and choices, uh, I'm not saying this word to blame you, and I'm not necessarily saying that it's a conscious choice. For Kelly, choice is when you go left and not right, or right and not left. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so it's like when you choose something, and we choose all the time, and we choose every day. And a lot of our con choices are quite conscious. So I'm here because it was a conscious choice. I didn't accidentally stumble into a webinar. Like, I had to make the thing. So that was a conscious choice. But there are also many choices that we make every day, now included, that are not necessarily conscious. So when you walk, you don't really have to make the choice to move one leg, the other leg, like each muscle. That's just absurd. So for Kelly, sometimes we our choices are unconscious. Actually, a lot of the times they are. Not necessarily even because they're unacceptable, some profoundly disturbing fantasies about one thing or another. Sometimes also because it's practical. So there are many reasons why our choices are not conscious. Sometimes it's because they truly seem unacceptable. At other times, it's just because it's easier to function that way. So a choice is basically every decision made consciously or unconsciously by our minds. So I'm not saying that it's your fault. That's specifically what I'm not saying. For me, choice is not about guilt. It's about responsibility. And I will talk about this a little later. Then the second thing is that we never choose what's superficially logical. If that were the case, no one would ever have a problem or a bad feeling ever because we would just keep doing what's logical. We choose between those alternatives that we see as open to us. So not you choose what is what works for you, what your experience tells you that you can choose from, not what's logical to me or even to you. There's an example here that's given uh, that, uh, let's say a therapist can advise a client be assertive. So that means just to kind of clearly articulate your needs in relationships with other people, to ask for what belongs to you. But let's say that a client has a, has a construct that says that you can either be submissive and miserable, or you can be very aggressive. So when I say, maybe you can try being more assertive, the client doesn't hear be assertive. The client can, has two boxes to put this in. One is I can be submissive and miserable, and the other is I can be unforgivably aggressive, as the example is here from David Winter. Um, and then if being unforgivably aggressive is, let's say, for many reasons, I'm making the client up now because I don't remember Winter's case. So, but let's say it means that I have to be like an aggressive alcoholic, like my father, for example. I mean, my father is not an aggressive alcoholic, so a medical example then I would rather choose to, submissive, to be submissive and miserable than to be like him. So from, from the therapist's point of view, he's just saying maybe you should be more assertive. But from the client's point of view, you're really saying you should be really very aggressive like your alcoholic father, for example. And so naturally, when the client hears that, the client will think, 
well, this is not exactly a viable alternative for me because the client will then say, I would rather be miserable and, and submissive. So we choose from whatever our experience has told us that we can choose from, not what's logical. And well, I guess that's not very fair for our choices, but it is logical, it's just not superficially logical. It has its, its internal kind of special logic, I guess you'd say. And then the second thing is, is that we always choose, which is really just a reinstatement of what I said before, we choose what will allow us to better anticipate future events. So that side of the choice that is more predictable, more elaborate, that we have more experience with, that's what we're more likely to choose. So this is what you should keep in mind when we talk about choosing avoidance. Avoidance allows you to better anticipate and therefore better control and kind of adapt better and adapt your environment better. You don't choose what's logical, you choose the best that you know. So whatever your experience brings. This is why I said that there are many, there, there's no, not one theory because everyone's experience will give you different choices to make. And then choices don't necessarily have to be conscious. A lot of our choosing is, as it says here, pre-verbal, meaning so old, that these kinds of dichotomies or constructs were created before we even mastered language. So we never really bothered to translate them into words. So we kind of use them, but we really can't articulate them with words. They make sense to us in a, in a different way. I guess one, one, if this is difficult for you to grasp, one way to look at this is, is for example, music. I've used this example over and over again, is that I insist that in my life and in my experience, there are two types of sadness. One is like the Chopin mazurka sadness, and then the other one is this dramatic, pathetic Russian pathos, like Rachmaninoff. So this is obviously not an official classification of sadness. And sometimes it's very difficult for me to articulate verbally what would fall into which category, but I feel it instantly. And it's very easy to classify things that way. For me. So it's, it's something that's not exactly verbal, but it is something that I can choose from, let's say. I'm going to give you an example of avoidance. Uh, I was trying to find different examples of it. And then I thought the boredom might be a very good example. And my neighbor, who's not my client, um, we did a little experiment about a year ago, sometime before COVID. And so I'm going to use this example. So a brief introduction to my client. I texted him the other day and I said, would you mind if I use your, your example to show to people what avoidance is? And he said, sure, but please call me Josh. I always liked that name. So he's Josh here. And so my, my neighbor is a, is a very, very nice guy, but he's a workaholic. Like, I mean, for European standards, I guess most Americans are anyway, but he is that times 10. Like he always works. So he's also a friend. And then sometimes like he'll, he'll come over, well, sometimes, sometimes in the past, he would come, come over, like we would have dinner, a few of us. And he would sometimes work while being with us. Like he would just open his tablet and then work. It was, he's really obsessed with work. And then it kind of became a running joke at some point that Josh just cannot stand boredom. That he's just, his work ethic is just so strong that he just cannot be bored. And so one time when he came over, we were supposed to have dinner. I, I, was, I was finishing up this workshop that I was giving on how to use different imagery to work with your, with your emotions. So basically how to use images, so not to create art, but to use already done art to, to learn how to symbolize and communicate your emotions. And so I had this stack of printed images, like several stacks actually on my table when he came around and he started playing with them and looking at them. And he said, well, this is very interesting. What is this for? So I explained about the workshop and everything. And he said, oh, that's a nice idea. Uh, maybe one day we can try something. And then of course, like the light went out in my head and I thought, well, fun, funny you should say that, but you do need therapy. You know, I can't be your therapist, but I can sure help you maybe kind of touch upon some important stuff. So I pushed all these images towards him and I said, let's explore something and let's explore your boredom. I subtly suggested. And so I told him that he needs to find images uh, that would illustrate boredom. Like, what does it feel like to be bored? So since he does, he's not a very patient person because he cannot stand to be bored, supposedly. Um, so I just kind of briefly told him that I'm going to leave him in the room for a couple of minutes, uh, that he should remember what it feels like to be bored and then find those images 
that resonate with his feelings, or at least images that cause him to feel a similar way. So I left for five minutes, came back, still nothing on the table, went away again, and 10 minutes later, there he was with three pictures. Two of them represented boredom, one represented work. And so I, I, he put them like this. So I told him to tell me why did he choose these specific images and sort of tell me a story based on them. And so here's the story. It starts when you have nothing to do. So you come home from work, you sit down, you're tired, and suddenly you realize that you still think about work. So all these thoughts are running in your head. And so he told me in the first image, the one that you see on the left, uh, there's a kind of like a silhouette of a person. And then every one of these heads is a thought. That's what it feels like to him, or at least the closest thing based on the image. So these thoughts, they start wandering around your head, but then the more they circle, the more thoughts they attract, and then your head becomes too small. So they start running around your body. And then as they run around your body, I mean, that's the story that he's, he told based on the, on the illustration. They start bumping into other parts of your body. So then, and then they start creating these strange sensations, like you're tickling, you're itching everywhere. And then all of a sudden, they start becoming very upset because there's a lot of them. And then your body becomes small. And then what happens is the second image, which is that it's not like just thoughts repeating themselves. It's like your whole body is screaming. And then he said how there's this man entity thing. I don't know what it is, trapped inside this egg and the egg is very small. And that's exactly what his body feels like. It feels like there's too much going on. There's too much screaming, too much yelling. And it's kind of, it becomes too tight to contain everything. So this is just pain, this is boredom, something that's supposed to be very uneventful. And then the third picture, and he said, well, this is not boredom. This is when things go back to normal. Because just thinking about boredom in that way made him a little antsy. So this is, a, again, let's say a person playing some sort of an instrument. So I said, OK, so how do you transition from this obviously very intense state into this rather peaceful person playing an instrument? And he said, that's what happens when you get your hands dirty, meaning like when you do something with your hands. You can focus on what you're doing, and then you don't hear the screaming. And even the way that he phrases this shows you avoidance. So you don't hear the screaming. It's not that it stops. It's not that it goes away. It's just that you turn your back on it. You focus on something that you like or something that gives you some sort of pleasure, like playing this instrument, and then you don't hear everything that's happening inside of you. So, my friend Josh is working too much is actually a way to avoid all the screaming that he feels inside. And he described it in rather vague terms, uh, like it's, it's screaming, it's noise, it's thoughts, because he doesn't really know what's in there. Because his avoidance patterns have been going on for so long that he doesn't really even know what he's avoiding now. And because he doesn't know, it seems even worse because you can't even put a name to it. So it becomes this kind of shapeless, amorphic thing that all you know is evil and nothing else. And that's also another thing that happens when we, when we avoid things too much is that we don't even see what we avoid, but we just know that it's bad. And because of how intensely anxious or uncomfortable we feel when we come in contact with that, we just validate that it's bad and keep running away. And that kind of validates the cycle of avoidance. After this finished, I tried, after he explained the story, I tried to go back and explore the first stage a little bit more because as a, you know, as, as a therapist, that's the part that I like. I like to understand the content of, of someone's mind. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would be very happy to tell you the story, but look at the time other people will come, let's just go. And he got up and went to the balcony, which was about as far as you can get from the table. So he kind of even avoided talking about avoidance. And since I'm not his therapist, I just let it go. And fortunately, he, he gave me the permission to use this. So this is one very interesting aspect of, of how avoidance works, how it maintains itself, but also at the same time, how boredom, which is something that you wouldn't think that you would typically avoid because it's not exactly guilt, anxiety, the end of the world, but it's also this, it's, 
outside of something that sounds so simple, there is a very complex and rich psychological life. Boredom in itself is a way to, to avoid it by kind of just erasing everything that happens. So let's talk a little bit about so how how do, why is it what are some specific ideas that allow people uh, to avoid emotions and how these specific uh, as I say here implicit assumptions about emotions lead to avoidance and what are the repercussions of this for therapy or any kind of development you know however you choose to pursue it. So here's one example. All these are examples from my clients and they've all given me permission to, to use this. So these are all from SkinPick, the, the ones that I'm, I'm quoting here. Uh, so one client says, my emotions are just irrational. What's the point of listening and trying to understand something that makes no sense? They need to stop and that's it. So the underlying assumption here is that emotions are irrational. What is this assumption based on? That's a long story, and I guess it's different from everyone. But let's just look at the assumption itself. They're irrational, meaning that they have no logic to them, there's no rule to them, and that there's nothing really to understand. And then what's the, the logical next step for when you label something as irrational, which is that you're not even going to bother listening. And if you remember, the, from the previous slide that the more my friend Josh basically ignores, the, more, the tighter his body becomes. So if he doesn't really pay attention to his anxiety or whatever it is that he feels, it becomes more and more intense. And then, you know, you run away, you come back, you see that it's intense and so on and so on. So eventually uh, it becomes scarier and scarier and scarier. And then the scarier something gets, the easier it is to actually write it off as irrational, if you think about it. It's like, Let's say that I ask you a question, you ignore me because you think I'm irrational. I ask you a question again, you ignore me again. I ask you a question again, you ignore me again. And then eventually I will stop, start yelling at you and you know, tell you, yell my question at you and then yell, stop ignoring me. And then you will look at me and then you will say, well, you're completely crazy. No, I'm really not gonna talk to you. So when you label something as irrational and it keeps coming back, it becomes more, it becomes easier to label it as something irrational. And also the, the, the guide for action from this implicit assumption here is that if it's, some, if it's something irrational, there's no talking to that, there's no dialogue. All you need to do is make it stop and goodbye. I guess maybe if, if I were to dig a little deeper here, there's also an implicit assumption that you can actually control what you feel because they just need to stop and that's it. But the main one here is that it's irrational. Then there's another one. I'm just hardwired that way, it's biology. You're asking me a question that makes no sense. My question was what, what it means to feel something. Of course I'm avoiding them. We're biologically programmed to avoid what's unpleasant. There's no way around it. So this is a very frequent one. I will often hear people say things like, I can't help it, it makes no sense, it's just biological. Sure, I guess we can argue that our capacity to feel, like to, to have a certain quality of emotions might be hardwired, although research kind of suggests that it's a little more complex than that, but let's even adopt that belief. It's really very easy to disprove because we all have experiences that, that we change the way we feel about things. Like you love someone and then you stop loving them at some point. It's not because you've lost the capacity to love. It's because what this person means to you has changed. And then your reaction to that person has changed because the meaning has changed. So the way that we react specifically to certain things is not because we're biologically hardwired to do so, but it's because of what these things mean to us. And when you change the meaning, you're more, more likely to change the way you feel about something. So even if our emotions are genetic to a great extent, we're really not slaves to them. And also, you know, the, it is something that we all have in our experiences that we react differently to things. Like I know, for example, I don't know, I can give you dozens of examples uh, from my own life, how I've changed the way I've, I've, I've felt about the same thing. Like, I don't know, let's let's say politics because that one was a, a very recent and interesting insight. Um, I really love politics. I follow it religiously and not just like one country. I, I'm the kind of person that stays up all night to see the results of elections in Argentina or 
Estonia. I really like politics a lot. And to me, the way I look at it now is currently is like a mixture of, of learning about the choices that people make, you know, like practicing my, my constructivist theory. So this is like trying to understand why is it people make certain choices. And, and then also like a chess game. But I remember maybe five, six, 10, 15 years ago when, when politics was much more emotional to me. And it's not, it's not that I lost the ability to be angry anymore or to be unhappy with something. And my genes are likely the same as they were before. It's just that the way I think about it has changed. And then therefore the way I react to it has changed as well. So this is something that we all have in our experience that we may have genes, but they really don't determine every aspect of our life. However, if you do adopt this paradigm, you basically lock yourself from change. If you say that something is biologically programmed, then how, on, or like hardwired, or however you want to call it, how on earth do you talk yourself out of it? Like I cannot have dark hair unless I dye it. There's no, there's no talking cure to have different eye color. Like those are things that are genetically determined. And so, like when you when you choose to see something as being only genetic and nothing else, you're essentially saying I'm powerless to change it. Or maybe you're saying, well, I should just medicate myself to death and then feel nothing because you know you fight fire with fire. Genes give me this, I give them diazepam. So it's like it it kind of steers you in a certain course of action. So basically, when you say something is genetic, it, you're saying I have no responsibility for this. And if you're saying I have no responsibility for this, then how are you going to change something? So in that sense, uh, this can also lead to avoidance because it tells you all oh, this is just crazy molecules, pay, pay them no mind, just drown them out somehow. Here's another one. How can I face my emotions when I'm just hypersensitive as a person? I can't handle it. I can only distract myself, but I can't handle. I don't even know what it means to handle. So as a, as a therapist, when I read this, I think, okay, so this person needs coping skills, right? Uh, she may need, well, the client was actually a he, but I'm looking at the, the painting on the right. Um, so he just needs to learn how to understand emotions and how to react to them, right? It, to me, that just is a commonsensical assumption, but not to my client. For him, he says he's hypersensitive as a person, which kind of essentializes his hypersensitivity, if you think about it. So the implicit assumption is not that he needs coping skills. The implicit assumption is that the way he is, that his essence as a person is just too hypersensitive, which also tells you that there's nothing that he can do about it because he just is a hypersensitive person. We often make this mistake, like you, people who have low self-esteem, for example, make this same mistake where they tend to essentialize certain things. And then they will not say, I feel that I have failed, for example, or this strategy didn't work. They will say, I'm a failure, which kind of turns this whole person into something that is just not fixable anymore. And then if you are hypersensitive as a person, what is it that you can do except avoid something? It's kind of like if you're allergic to something, you can take you know, medication to kind of regulate it, or you can just avoid whatever makes you, whatever you're, you happen to be allergic to. That's the kind of thinking. Let's just look at this, this sentence and let's just rephrase it slightly. Let's say that instead I'm hypersensitive as a person, we can say, I don't have appropriate coping skills. So then look at the sentence. How can I face my emotions when I don't have appropriate coping skills? I can't handle it. The guide to action from this assumption would be, well, let's get some coping skills. You know, let's see what we can do. But if you're just that way, there's nothing you can do. So if you have this implicit assumption about emotions, it kind of logically leads to you either trying to, um, trying to avoid them or just make them go away in some way. There's another one. I see myself as a positive person, and that's the only thing I want to let into my life. There is no space for the bad stuff because I want the good stuff only. I deserve to be happy. Now, of all the, the, the implicit assumptions, I think this one, for me at least as a therapist, tends to be very difficult to deal with. The reason is because 
in the previous ones, you kind of assume about what the nature of things is. You say like, I'm genetically like this, or I'm just this type of a person at my core, and that's it. But these are the beliefs that you can kind of argue with by actually providing, not argue with, but challenge in a way by providing a different perspective. So let's say you say my emotions are just irrational. So what I can do is offer an explanation for a certain emotional reaction or through our dialogue together, we, we come to an explanation. And then you can, you can sort of see that it will click on, you know, on some level and you'll think, huh, well, maybe this Vladimir guy isn't that crazy. Maybe there's something to what he's saying. So I can kind of tickle your imagination or, or offer you a different way of reasoning. You can try it out and then you can see if it works. But with this one, this one is not essentialist at all because it starts with, I see myself as, and I see this with younger clients. And I think it has to do maybe with the way that we, we started sort of thinking as, as a culture about identity. And then often young people will say, see things, I see myself as, and then therefore this is the only thing that's good for me. Uh, and once I had a client who actually had read Kelly and was a constructivist, I guess, in the ways that they approached life. And so they had this, these statements like, uh, I remember this one specifically was, my psychiatrist told me that I have borderline personality disorder, but he's wrong because I don't see myself as a person that has BPD. Then I thought, well, not really, because I mean, I can see myself as, I don't know, Brad Pitt, but I'm still not Brad Pitt. So there, there's, a, there's a kind of fallacy there. And then I remember in our conversations, the, the client said something along the lines, well, you're supposed to be a constructivist. Shouldn't you believe that we should construct our own reality? And then my answer to this is, well, no. I mean, constructivism really does give you a lot of freedom to conceptualize your experiences in whatever way you like, because it is true. Constructivism is in that sense, extremely liberal because it cannot claim that any statement is absolutely true. You can only say that it works. It's like pragmatism in a way. But the thing is, is that not everything works. So th this is very difficult to argue with because people can see themselves in any way they like. And then the trick is, is to see how much of your experience doesn't really match how you see yourself. Because at the end of the day, no matter how subjective our worlds are and how really different and unique our experiences are, we're not free to imagine some weird semantic construction and give it to ourselves if it doesn't match our experience. Because in constructivism, every construct, every identity, everything you build for yourself, you build so that you can have practical tools and so that you can anticipate events and kind of deal with the world. So if your construction of yourself is detached from reality to that extent, it will not work. You have to put a lot of energy to avoid and reject reality to kind of keep your, your theory. So when you say I want the good stuff only, it means really I cannot accept the bad stuff because it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the way I see myself. And because it doesn't fit with the way I see myself, I have no idea what to do. So this is not, I see myself as a positive person and therefore I reject all the bad stuff. This is, I have no idea what to do with it. Because one of the things that I like about Kelly's theory is that he explains why we do these things and we do them all the time and we all do them. Is that when we only have one theory to explain something, so only one way to see ourselves or the world, so there's no backup. And you notice that this theory doesn't work what we tend to do is we tend to keep using it again and again and again. And of course, every time reality will tell you, nah, false answer doesn't work. But sometimes we'll fudge the evidence a little bit. We'll kind of falsify reality so that it fits our theory. And this is why this is very difficult to change because there are 101 maneuvers that you can do to kind of fool yourself and me uh, into believing that you really are the way you think of yourself because that's the only thing, the way, the only way you can see yourself. I hope that makes sense. If not, please ask away and I will be happy to clarify. But the point here specifically is that if you see yourself as only that, then there's no room for anything else. So therefore you have to ignore it, push it away, kind of retell the story so that you preserve the way you see yourself. 
And then the real change that has to take place is in you seeing yourself as a positive, optimistic person. So that has to go. When I say that has to go, it doesn't mean you have to see yourself as, as a miserable, pessimistic person, because that also has to go. The whole dichotomy has to go. And this is usually a very complex change to make. And uh, I think a lot has, can be said about how perfectionists can fit into this picture. So let's just summarize this briefly. So our implicit assumptions about emotions determine how we handle them when they arise. So they tell you what it means and they tell you how to deal with it. Therefore, to understand your specific type of avoidance, you need to examine your implicit assumptions. Again, if we apply Kelly's idea, it means that your implicit assumption explains your emotions. It's your theory of emotion, let's say. And the reason why you keep employing it is because you don't have another one. And very often we can't even put the one we have into words. So that's the first task to kind of explicate these, to put them into words and then look how, what, we, what you need to keep from this and then what you need to reject. Because if, if something, if, if an assumption about the world or your emotions or anything else maintains itself, it's because there's something good there and there's something useful there. Of course, the guide for action is absolutely bad in all of these situations. Like avoidance is never the answer. Otherwise you wouldn't be having this webinar. But, but at the same time, that means that you, that you cannot reject all of it, but you have to keep some of it. And to know what to keep and what to change, you really have to put it into words and dissect it very carefully. So let's just recap how avoidance leads to picking. So the, oh, this is not, you can't see it all. One second. Oh, you can, okay. So it starts with some sort of distress. So anything, uh, we're starting from this small circle here. Um, it starts with any sort of distress. So anything that makes you feel um, in any kind of negative way, like it doesn't matter what it is, but there's always an initial moment of distress. With focus picking, it's very easy, or mostly it's easy to figure out what it is. With automatic picking, it's a little more difficult as you would imagine, because you're not there to know what, what's happening. Like you're not very present, you're doing something else. But there's always a moment of distress, which can be external or internal. So something can happen outside, or you can simply have a random thought that you cling to and it makes you feel a certain way. Whatever event kind of falls into your awareness or semi-awareness, it connects to an appropriate implicit assumption. So whatever you think about emotions, either from your experience or from your family or your culture, because these are all these, all the different places where we get our assumptions from, right? So this implicit assumption will tell you what the event means. What is this distress that you're facing? It will tell you what it means and it will tell you how to deal with it. In the case of skin picking, once this unpleasantness arises, what happens is that whatever your implicit assumptions are or your construct, as Kelly might say, uh, they will tell you, avoid this, like don't even go there. This is not for you. That would be the, my subtle interpretation of it. And then what the practical guide for action is, is avoid. So let's say it can mean, don't be anxious, pick. It can mean, don't be angry, pick. Don't get into an argument, don't confront people, pick. Because there's always this, let's say, energy of, of distress. Like there's this excitation of the body that needs to be channeled into something. Because if you're truly going to avoid the emotion properly, you can't have this, uh, this excitement because it will keep reminding you that you're in distress. And you, know, you really don't want to face the distress. So you have to do something with this, with this excitation of your body. And then what you do is you pick because it's, it's an available resource. Like you can pick anywhere, anytime, right? So your implicit assumption says pick now, because if you pick, you can put all your nervous energy into that. And then you can devote your, your mental energy to properly avoiding things by doing anything else, right? Once this energy is kind of out of your body through picking, what happens is this sense of relief, like phew, it's gone, it's out. It's not in me anymore. Or it can even feel like gratification. Sometimes people will uh, take a look at, like they will try to extract 
like something white or pus of some sorts or dirt or something else. And it will actually lead to this feeling of reward. Like, look, I've achieved something. I've done something. The nervous energy is gone. The bad emotion, what bad emotion? And in that moment, you know it worked. And so the relief and the gratification, which I endlessly obsess over in, in, in skin pick, and people sometimes say, like, how many gross details do you need me to tell you about this? Like, why are you asking me? But it's very important because this gratification and this relief is, is, is at the same time also validation of avoidant experiences. So you, by, by having this relief, by having this sense of achievement, you're actually reinforcing the avoidant pattern and then obviously reinforcing the implicit idea about avoiding emotions. Because in a sense, it is a validation of that idea. The idea may not be true, but it's still validated. And this is why I just love constructivism so much, because it doesn't matter whether or not it's essentially true. What only it matters is that your anticipations are confirmed. Because that's the only way that our minds know if anything is true. Is you, it's like in science. You make a hypothesis, you test it. If it's confirmed, you keep the theory. If not, get it out and then find something else. And it's the same thing in our own experience. So every time that, that you get relief and gratification from picking, you confirm whatever underlying hypothesis is about it. So in itself, it creates a little bit of a circle there. And like it, it, it can go on and on and on forever. So there will be more distress because there's distress in life. And then every time you have distress, it's these constructs about what distress means that will activate themselves, go to picking and so on. This is why when we, when we start treating skin picking, we always start with habit reversal training because that's a good way to cut into this part where avoidance usually is. Essentially, we don't disturb the, the pattern. We just insert a new type of avoidance with competing responses. And so the gratification is not as strong so you don't get the same kind of validation for your hypothesis, but the circle still remains and it can operate. And that allows you to minimize damage to get some control over this, this whole thing. And then also gives you time to actually work on changing the implicit assumptions. I hope this, this was clear because this is quite an important part. So what are the consequences of avoidance? Uh, in the short term, they're usually, let's say, good, or the reinforcing ones, at least, the validating ones, which is relief and gratification. And obviously, the sensation that this dreaded experience is now gone. It's not coming back today. In the long term, avoidance gives you more negative consequences because it basically exacerbates, makes worse those experiences that you actually try to avoid. It's kind of like with my friend Josh. The more he avoids uh, what's happening inside of him, the more vague it becomes. You, you really, like if you never face something, then you just kind of forget what it is. A after a while, you just know that, you know, room on the left, bad, never going there. But you've forgotten what's inside. So there's absolutely no way for you to actually have a workable strategy for it unless you face it. And you can't face it because you know it's bad. So avoidance actually makes you forget about parts of who you are. And I know this sounds dramatic, but that's really literally what it is. There are parts of your personality that you systematically avoid seeing and dealing with because there's this implicit assumption that whatever it is, it's bad. And it is really not necessarily so. So uh, I, just a small remark, uh, whenever I put these these paintings and different kinds of, this is a print, uh, but this, this, the artwork, it's usually in some way related to what I'm talking about. And oftentimes I use it as a reminder because I don't like to make notes like in, in PowerPoint because I like to like make stuff up as I go along basically. Um, so I put these images sometimes to serve as reminders of something that I could say or an example that I could give. Sometimes I forget what my initial intention was, but here I, I didn't. This is a Cuban printmaker called Belki Sayon, which you have, you have her name down below. Uh, she's really a remarkable artist. Like her art is slightly unsettling and a little bit creepy at times, as you can see this, 
but it really fits into this topic of avoidance perfectly. She sadly passed away at the end of, like, I think it was 1999 or 1998. And in one of the last interviews that she gave, um, she said, I tried to find the interview, but I couldn't, so I'm going to paraphrase it from, from memory. She said something along the lines that the, the purpose that art serves for her, at least at that stage as she saw it, was to bring, to take outside everything that lives on the inside, but that's, that makes life unbearable. So for her life, uh, art was a kind of way out of avoidance. It was a way to symbolize and communicate all these things that you just could not process inside because you just couldn't look at them. So it was a, it's like, like a poetic way to do session six, uh, session six techniques in the program, like a, a way to create a little bit of distance between you and your worst nightmare. And the way that she actually did it was quite literally to reveal things. A lot of her work, I think almost all of her work that I've seen revolves around this uh, secret, I couldn't, you can't say religion, I guess, but it's like a club, something like Freemasonry called Abakwa. So it's, it's, it, it, they have their own language, a set of esoteric beliefs that we don't know anything about because, well, I will assume that most of us on the call are not members. It's also a men, men only society. So it exists to my knowledge only in Cuba and I suppose also by the proxy in, in Florida as well. Um, so they speak their own language. They have a set of beliefs that no one knows about. And most of the time people won't even tell you that they're members. And it's only for men. And so what she did was to try and depict their mythology, to kind of bring it out in the open. Uh, and she did it in visually the most stunning way. And what's interesting to me is that she never had problems with the, with the Cuban government. Even though now, as I'm, as I'm saying all this, I'm thinking, like, has it not struck a chord with anyone that this is really very political? But apparently, at the time, it didn't. So this is an example of how to bring out to bring outside of yourself all these things that you don't know how to live with. And when you look at this painting, and if you just I don't know, take a moment to appreciate it, it really is unsettling, isn't it? That's what makes it good. So what are some problems other than picking that, that might be caused or that experiential avoidance uh, may contribute to? So obviously skin picking, hair pulling, all body focused repetitive behaviors pretty much fall into this, like make use of this mechanism. Addiction is a really very obvious example of this. So uh, I don't think you need a degree in, in psychiatry or psychology to realize that drug addiction of, of any kind is really avoiding reality in some way. Like if you've known anyone who is addicted to anything, you know, what are the moments when they reach for the addiction? It's usually when whatever the world is becomes too much, too much stress, too much work, too much uh, problem, you know, too many problems in a relationship, whatever it is, but that's where when addiction becomes most powerful. It, it goes for people who drink, it even goes for people who smoke. Like I remember when I was growing up, smoking wasn't like, you, you could still smoke indoors and things like that. And I remember family members that used to smoke and then like if they would watch the news, they would say something like, well, now I have to smoke or like I need a cigar now after having an argument, which my God, too bad that as a child, I didn't know how to say, you know, avoidance, 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 because that's what it was. Then panic disorder is also a form of avoidance. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder can also involve avoidance. Agoraphobia or any kind of phobia is almost literally avoidance. OCD as well, can be a type of experiential avoidance. So it has a lot of consequences. Like I said in the beginning, procrastination of any kind is avoidance. There are many ways in which people can, can avoid things. Um, I remember before one of, the, one of the other webinars, like I don't remember when it was, it was something like one of the first webinars that we had. I logged in as I always do earlier to set it up so that when you, when you arrive, you have the, you know, so, you know, when we're starting, you know, that you're in the right place. And I was very exhausted. I was tired, tired, tired. Like I had worked a gazillion hours that day. And then I kept, and I turned on my, my camera to try it. And my microphone initially didn't work. And my first thought was, oh, well, no webinar today. But it was just so simple. And I was ready to use it as an excuse not to have the webinar. But then I thought, wait, 
It's like, you're tired, but that's entirely your fault. It's none of these, these people's fault. So you will have the webinar and then you will sleep early and not work afterwards. So I kind of had to negotiate with myself, but my initial impulse was, look, here's a handy excuse. Let's just not do the, call the whole thing off. That would also be avoidance. And even when you know you're avoiding, it still creeps in sometimes. That way. So it's just like a very, very human thing, let's say. So there, this is a point that I will be hammering in. Uh, let me see what time it is. Crap, I'm behind schedule, sorry. So I will be returning to this point over and over again, which is that the stress, the, the quote is pain is inevitable, but suffering is not. So I, in the cycle that I described a few slides ago, there was the, that starting point with the stress and just replace the stress, replace pain with the stress and you get pretty much my point, which is that there's always going to be discomfort in the world and there's no psychology or drug, legal or illegal, that will get you away from it. It's just not something that we humans can avoid. And there's like, to my knowledge, we still don't have a psychological theory that will say that we don't have to be in some sort of pain or discomfort. Suffering, however, is optional. And I will explain what this distinction means. The author of the quote, by the way, is um, Gunaratana is his last name. I've practiced saying that. Um, is, I believe he's located somewhere in Virginia and he's a Buddhist monk and he wrote an excellent book on mindfulness called Mindfulness in Plain English. There's so much literature on mindfulness out there and sometimes I suspect that the authors are not really good meditators or at least they don't do it regularly. But this book was written by someone who's lived every word of it, and it's quite practical and quite useful. So if you want to learn properly how to meditate and don't mind Buddhist terms, he's the guy to go to. So the stress is something that we have to ex accept as, as a part of life. Avoidance is always temporary, so it will give you relief for an hour or half an hour, depending on the source of the stress. But you cannot really eliminate the stress. There's just no way around it. So that's something that must be accepted. Another point that it would be nice if you take away from this is that avoidance basically feeds itself in the way that I described that it kind of validates itself. It drains us of energy. It's extremely exhausting to, to avoid all the time. Because even when you, when you kind of remove something from your conscious mind, it still stands there in some strange way, like implicitly, metaphorically, it's still there. It's in the back of your mind and it's not going away. And then you constantly have to run away from it, run away from it, run away from it. It's, it's like mindfulness in reverse in some strange way. And that really is exhausting. I, I, I give this example often, which is procrastinating. Um, I am known to hate paperwork of any kind. And then we have to write reports or do something like this or, you know, file taxes, um, I will think of anything so I don't have to do that. I'll remember a book to read, emails to respond to, webinars to prepare for, sessions to prepare for, anything. And then I know that even though I might be reading a book, I'm actually not reading a book. I'm actually avoiding doing the paperwork. I'm manif manifestly, like when you look at me on the side, I'm reading a book. But in reality, my focus is not so much on reading as it is on actively not doing something else. So avoidance is always requires a lot of energetic investment. We know this even before constructivism and certainly before acceptance and commitment therapy or any form of CBT. Freud knew this very well, where he said that suppression and repression and these defense mechanisms work very well, but they come at an incredibly high cost because you constantly have to invest energy to keep them up and running. So in the long run, avoided behaviors will drain you of energy. And what will happen? Well, when you're tired, you're more likely to pick because there's less self-control, there's less willingness to do anything productive. There's more guilt, more shame, more low self-esteem because you can't do things in the way that you would like them to do. You like to do them. So that's another way in which it kind of perpetuates itself. It's a very smart mechanism. I will, I will give avoidance that. And again, like when we avoid our limitations or any other source of distress, we're really not actually growing and developing. The, the whole point of, of therapy or I guess any kind of change in life is so that you get the skills and the ideas to deal with life. 
And if you avoid where your, let's say, weak spots are, if you avoid looking at them, if you avoid working with them, how on earth can you possibly ever surpass, surpass them? How can you change them? How can you reinforce them? So avoidance actually means you don't grow. You may come up with this palette of remarkably complex strategies, sometimes ingenious strategies, I have to say, but you're still not developing where you should really be growing and developing. So avoidance strategies are kind of stilting our growth in a, in a way. There's a, there's a term in, in constructivist psychology called structural arrest, which is when you use constructs that don't, in a sense, belong to your age, like something that, that stopped working a long time ago, but you never revised it, you just kind of kept on using it. So that's what avoidance does to us. It cements us at one stage of development and doesn't allow us to update ourselves in those areas where update is what we really need. Where, where change comes easy, it usually means that it's not necessary. So I, I mentioned the word construct a few times. Um, basically, it's like a dichotomous structure. It's a choice that you have. And then for acceptance and commitment therapy, the opposite pole, so if you have a construct, on one side you have avoidance, and then the, the, the opposite pole of avoidance is acceptance. So when we're talking about avoidance not being the desirable thing, we're actually saying implicitly again that acceptance is the good side. So the definition that I've found of acceptance and which I don't quite like, but I just fudged it and simplified it a little bit so that it works for me. Acceptance is the opposite of avoidance, like I said. It's willingness to seek out internal experiences and see them clearly. If you remember in the beginning, I kind of reworked that definition to say, that uh, avoidance is willingness to alter our experiences so that we don't have to face them. Acceptance is you actually looking for experiences, just opening yourself up to them. So it is the exact opposite thing where there's willingness to change here, there's willingness to seek out and see clearly. And this seeing clearly is, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is because Acceptance doesn't mean that you say, okay, I pick, so I really don't want to change. It doesn't mean uh, that you're going to suddenly become happy because you're picking, none of that. Acceptance just means acknowledging the way things are for you at this time. So not the way things are for me or for anyone else, just the way they are for you. It's like just keeping your eyes open and, and like listing what you see. That's what acceptance is. There's really very little chance of change, or at least intentional in changing, if you don't accept something. Because what you don't accept, you don't see. And what you don't see, you cannot really change strategically and you know, in a smart way. Uh, we change all the time. That's, again, one of those things about humans. We just interact with the world all the time and we do change. But unless you see things clearly and map out a way, you can't really control your change. So let's see how what would be a slightly healthier way to build assumptions about emotions and psychology, and then we'll see how we can put this into practice. So one is accepting that the stress is unavoidable. So there's always going to be something painful and uncomfortable. That the stress is impermanent. And I have to say, like as a human being, not as a therapist, I find great comfort in this. Um, for me, the fact that things are not impermanent, it actually makes me feel better when they're horrible because I know they will end. I just re remind myself of the fact that whatever I'm experiencing will not last forever. And it just, I don't even know why, and maybe it won't work for everyone. For me, it just makes things just a little bit easier at that moment. Uh, and we kind of forget this because when we suffer, we tend to lose our perception of time and then suffering becomes everything. So our emotional experiences are information about different ways in which the stress is affecting us. So feeling guilt tells you something about the quality of your behavior. Um, feeling anxiety tells you something about what you need right now, what the limitations of your experience are. It directly points you where to go to behave differently. If we don't spend enough time observing, learning, sitting, feeling these things, it's really hard to see what direction you need to change in. So 
So difficult emotions are not enemies. In fact, if anything, they're well-meaning allies. It's usually our implicit assumptions about them that make them the enemy. Things like, if I'm a strong person, I don't feel fear or some such nonsense. I'm, I mean, I myself am guilty of these sometimes. So I, it's like, it's a silly assumption, but sometimes like in my life, I know that I've said this to myself. I would like, I would go into a situation that would be terrifying. And then I would say to myself, you're not supposed to feel fear. Like you don't care, even though my actual experience of fear tells me that I care deeply. But I kind of override it with this idea of who I am, whereas that's not really who I am. I am whatever is happening in the moment. So if we we'll tune into these experiences and listen to them, they can actually tell us how to grow or even sometimes point us into these directions where we have resources, but we don't see them because of who we're supposed to be. Clinging and pushing away distress or clinging to or pushing away distress always turns it into suffering. So something doesn't become suffering until you try to, to avoid it, alter it, or bully it out of, out of your life. When we feel good things, we tend to cling on to them. That's a, like a, I'm yet to meet a human who doesn't do that. But because our experiences are impermanent, when you start clinging to them, that also causes a dose of suffering, meaning that you already fear losing them before they're even gone. And then when they start going away, instead of enjoying whatever you can from that pleasant experience, you just kind of want to hug it and just keep it there always. Like that example from a client who only wants good things and doesn't want bad things. On the other hand, and so you can actually have suffering even with good things because you try so desperately to keep them. And then you fail because everything kind of changes. So you can't do that. And second of all, you don't even enjoy them while they're there because you're too busy trying to find ways to keep them there forever. And then pushing away is something that's much easier, I guess, to relate to, which is that if something hurts, if something is unpleasant, our instinct is almost always to just run away from it. And if we can't run away from it, we try to somehow make it stop or make it go away. Like having bad emotions or bad thoughts what we usually do is I should not feel this or I should not think this. And then the more you push it away, the stronger it comes back. So it's basically causing you double suffering. So there's this distress from just experiencing something that's unpleasant. And then there's, there's this suffering that we create from the way that we relate to that experience. And since it is impermanent, if we just let it stay, it will go away on its own. And we kind of make it more permanent by trying to push it away and giving it additional strengths. This is this happens very often when in therapy, for example, people start talking about, and this is especially the case with this for old fashioned face-to-face -face therapy, is when people start talking about something that was that's deeply difficult and painful. What they what they what their initial instinct is to say, well let's change the topic or uh, or just wander away to something else or try to avoid answering the question. Or sometimes it happens that if I have a very difficult session with someone, sometimes I think at the end of the session, I would bet money that you're not going to come back next time. And then the client next time will send me a message, I'm stuck in traffic, I'll see you next week. And that's one way to push away you know, the stuff that we don't like to face. Almost like in that moment, there's a part of us that thinks if I just skip this week, my psyche will be entirely different two weeks from now. And it never is. And then there's the part where we have to kind of open up to distress and listen to it and then learn and grow. So, but how to change your relationship? Let me just, I will, I will give you like just a four step process, which is a lot simpler when I put it on the slide than it is in actual reality. So analyze your avoidance patterns very carefully. This is very important and try to identify as many as you can. Examine your implicit assumptions that fuel these avoidant patterns, and but give yourself time. This is not easy to put into words. Just observe yourself, journal, write things down, communicate with your therapist if you're in therapy, and then practice opening up to these difficult experiences, and then use whatever happens when you open up to these experiences to create more sustainable narratives or rather those assumptions that we talked about. Create, create new assumptions based on your actual experiences, not imagined experiences. And then you might rightfully ask, well, what on earth does it mean to open up to difficult experiences? And 
trust me, I have struggled to give you a precise definition of it because it's something that experientially, it's very clear when it's happening. Like you always know, but it's very hard to define precisely. It's also one of the beautiful things about therapy is that this process of change is so mysterious sometimes. So it means to be able to look at the distress clearly. So it means acceptance, but it also means that you you allow yourself to be vulnerable. So to be emotionally exposed in front of yourself, in front of other people, and then to allow yourself to be transformed by the experience. That means that there has to be one little moment when you actually give up your control over, over your experience. When you allow yourself to be transformed, not to transform yourself. So there's this kind of leap of faith that whatever experience arises brings about a certain dose of wisdom. Call me Oprah, but I don't know how else to phrase it. This is very difficult. Like, even if you have a lot of experience in therapy, in meditation, whatever kind of personal growth, that moment when you're open and vulnerable and easily invalidated is extremely difficult to be in. We humans don't like it, but it's, it's very important because it's in these moments that you, it's, it, to me, it's always that moment when you're supposed to say I love you to someone first and you're not sure if you're necessarily going to get I love you to in return. Like that's that moment. When you're saying those words, and you're so easily hurt. And these are the moments where we can learn the most from our emotions. And it's being with these moments and kind of opening yourself up to them that will allow you to develop a healthier relationship to them. And I know that this is a huge demand and something that's very difficult, but these are truly those transformational moments. Except that clearly you should be very methodical about that. You kind of start being vulnerable where it's not too risky and then work your way up. So here's some ideas about how these assumptions can be changed so that you keep something from the old ones uh, and then transform them into something more useful. One uh, is that it should include workable strategies. So whatever your new way of looking at emotions is, it should really be able to incorporate whatever the reality of your emotions are in any moment in time. So you can, if you see emotions as information, as I proposed earlier, and as kind of Kelly proposed six years ago, that's preferable to seeing them as suffering, given that we cannot control having them. So that's one aspect of our experience that I dare say is common for, for most humans, is that we can't control our emotions. We can control our expression, whether or not we'll do something or say something or show them, but what we actually feel, not controllable. So since that's a fact of our experience, then we might as well use them as information instead of just seeing them as, I don't know, nature of genes inflicting unnecessary suffering upon us. So we can keep like the, the theory that it's all just programmed biologically. You can even work with that theory. It's still information. So you can kind of alter that idea to fit something more in. You keep the fundamental assumption, but allow yourself to make use of it. Then seeing distress as a consequence of our interaction with the world, so just something that happens because we're alive, is more sustainable than seeing it as being hurt by the world. Like it's not something the world does to us. It's not that we're specifically targeted by the cosmos in some way. It's just something that happens when we go through the world. We can make the best of it by learning from it, or we can turn it into suffering and then not benefit from it. Uh, experiencing is best seen as learning. So it's a strength to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to be open to experiences, even to be able to be with all the sadness and anxiety, and all this, all this intensity that comes. That's actually a strength because you're learning to stay, to stand and be stable with all these very intense emotions. So if you see being able to experience things as a strength, that will give you more information, more knowledge, and more power over the emotions rather than to see them as irrational, like somehow conditioned, or, or just seeing yourself as a perpetually hypersensitive person that stands no chance of ever handling their emotions. You can keep the some of the core ideas, like irrational can also mean very difficult to understand. And that would be a true thing to say because 
our emotions communicate in, in very bizarre ways. Like one of the reasons why I actually put this painting here is because when I saw it for the first time, I don't know when, when it was, it was on my computer, I thought how energizing it is. Now I have no idea what, what the intention of the author was because unfortunately I don't know too much about the painter other than she's obviously very talented, at least for me. But when I see this, it kind of energizes me. So to me, I put it in the end because I thought, well, that's something I will need. Like, it, there, there's a lot of strength that comes from learning these things about yourself. And yes, it may be very difficult to understand, even for me, why is it that, that this energizes me, but it does. So I can, I can translate irrational as very hard to understand, but I can still observe the logic of it, which is that even when I see it now, I just love it. it, just makes me happy. I'm very happy to see it, especially these dark blue, like very strong and active movements. It just kind of fill me up with something, I don't know. But so you can still keep the idea that it may not be rational, but you can still kind of find correlations. So there's a way not to say goodbye to your old ways of thinking, but to incorporate them and add to them. So that's my part, and I apologize for, for being so, so long. Um, just one word briefly about skin pick. So uh, we decided instead of the calls that we usually have, we're going to have another webinar next week, and we did this last month as well, where you can join, it's a very brief webinar, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, where I will present the program in more details and give you all the like the important information if you're interested in getting started. So you can you can also have your questions answered then, but about the program only. Um, 